was just uh, saying a little bit about my background. My parents were missionaries in South America. Uh, so I was brought up as one of five children, uh, as a child of a missionary. So I would hear often the gospel through my parents, my parents preaching. I was about 12 years old when I realized that the message was not for other people, but the message was for me. So I, yeah, I, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was about 12 years old. And uh, now, since then, lots of things uh, have happened, and you learn to learn lots of things about God's Word and how to live the Christian life. When I was about 17 years old, then I traveled back to London, to England, where I studied and uh, did my university training and so on. I, my subject was mathematics, so I studied mathematics and I found a job and worked uh, as a statistician in London for a couple of years. And that is where I met my wife, Annika, she's Dutch. So we are married, we had two children, and then we went ourselves to be missionaries also in Colombia. We served the Lord in Colombia for about 15 years. And then we are blessed with two more children in Colombia, so we have four children. And in 2007, that's 13 years ago, we came to live here in Holland, the country of my wife. So it was a little bit difficult because I had to learn the language, the Dutch language. Um, but now it, uh, I still have a strong accent, but people can understand me. But um, it's much easier for me to speak in English or in Spanish. But um, Dutch, yeah, well, I, can, I can do it. And, um, I serve here in Holland in Eindhoven. There's an assembly here of uh, about uh, 400 people, and I serve as one of the three elders in this assembly here for the last 10 years or so. Now, the, I remember when I was about um, ooh, my teenage years that I really felt that I had been born too late. I wish I would have been born 2,000 years ago so that I could accompany Paul on his journeys. I thought it was so cool for you know, Timothy and Titus and others to, to travel with the Apostle Paul to, to see how he debated things and discussed things on the ships and in churches and how he started, you know, how he got new churches started. It must be really cool to see him solving problems in churches with difficult people. Uh, just to get the wisdom of going with him, oh, I would love to carry his suitcase and travel along with him. But I was born 2,000 years too late. But one thing we do have um, is that we have the pastoral epistles. And those are, are three very important letters which Paul wrote, uh, one to Titus and two to Timothy. And in these letters, he does share a lot of how his methods of work and his passion and so on. So I have been over the years very much in love with those three pastoral letters. In the first, um, the letter to Titus, um, we find Paul, you know, he, he was traveling with Titus on the island and he has started a number of churches, local churches, and then he had to leave the island. So he let Timothy, Titus behind and said, hey, Titus, I, I know I have to go to Jerusalem, you know, so he catch an easy jet or something to go up to Jerusalem. But you stay behind and sort out the leadership in the church. The different churches need good leadership. So he gives them you know, some good advice on how to sort out leadership in churches. And, and people on the island were a bit relaxed. So, you know, doing good work was very important to us Christians. So, so Titus has lots of instructions about doing good things, good work. Now, the letter to Timothy, the first letter, is also similar to Titus. The focus is... Uh, quite often how to organize a church and how to organize the elders and uh, how to behave in the house of God. So that's also a very interesting letter. And we used it many times in Colombia when we worked to form the formation of new, new churches there. And then second letter of type, uh, Timothy. And that is very special because the second letter from Paul to Timothy is the last letter Paul writes. He's in prison. He sees the end is nearby. It's, um, he, he talks that, you know, I've run the good race. I have fought the good fight. I see the end approaching. So just imagine you're sitting in a prison. You know your end is near, maybe another six months or maybe another year or 10, I don't know. 
and then you're writing a letter to one of your close assistants, Timothy. He's not just an assistant. He's been, you know, he's been with you on your travels. He's been with, he's been as a friend, a younger friend. Maybe Timothy was, I don't know, 25 at this time or something like that. And Paul wants to give him some good advice before he departs. And that is the nice context of this letter. Just imagine if you were to write a letter before you die. Now, that would really help you focus. Now, what, what are the important things I want to tell my friends or my, my children or my wife or my husband? This uh, short letter, uh, second letter of Timothy, has four chapters. Uh, in the first chapter, uh, I've called it pastoral tips. There's a number of pastoral tips here in chapter one. In chapter two, we find proactive service, how to serve the Lord. Uh, chapter three is the prophetic chapter. How did Paul see the future? And it was important that, that Timothy would know something about the future. And then the last chapter, chapter four, is a personal chapter. Lots of details about people, friends, and, and tips and things, which we, um, yeah, are personal details. So uh, today, or Tonight, we'll be focusing on the first two chapters, the, past, the pastoral tips and the proactive service. And tomorrow, God willing, we hope to look at chapter three and four, which uh, deal with uh, the future and some personal matters. Now, I must say, when you're trying to share something about a letter like Second Timothy, and our time is limited to about 40 minutes, and you've got two chapters, it's very difficult to make choices. It's a bit like seeing a tree with lots of apples on it, and you say, ooh, 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 which apple shall I pick? Because there are lots of good apples. So I will pick a few apples and share with you uh, this evening, but I will also point out a few other apples, which I won't have time to pick, but maybe you can pick them on your own at some other time. Now, if we go then to 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, verse 1, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearest son. Of course, Paul is not the father of Timothy, but it's a close, it's a close relationship, like a father and a son. It shows us the age difference and the closeness. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 3, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. I serve. Now, here is one of the apples I want to pick. And this is the, the apple about this clear conscience. Um, what is your conscience? It, it is a bit strange because we know that Paul, he persecuted the church. He threw Christians in prison. He was present when they were stoning Stephen. Now, he did quite a few little bad things, we would say. And he says here he's been serving God. Um, since his forefathers, no, he, with a clear conscience. Now, in our head, there are a number of different voices. We have um, our own thinking. Have you noticed how you can talk to yourself? Say, oh, shall I buy this? No, I think it's a bit expensive. No, and, and then you kind of talking, and that's your own way of thinking, and that's, that's okay. God has made us thinking beings. We also have what some people call your intuition. Oh, it just feels right. And they say ladies have much more intuition. I don't know, but you know, there's something inside that gives you ideas. There is also God's voice. God speaks to us. God speaks through different uh, through ideas. He, he plants ideas in, in our heads. And sometimes you might be surprised with an idea that oh, I didn't, it, it, it may be God speaking to you through that idea. Sometimes, like Peter, when Jesus asked Peter, you know, who do the people say I am? And said, well, uh, you are Elijah or so on. And who do you think I am? And then Peter says, you are the son of the living God, Matthew 18. And to the great surprise of Peter, um, God, Jesus says to Peter, Men, man has not revealed that idea to, to you. That's not your idea. My father in heaven has revealed that answer to you. So he received a message, a revelation from God in that answer, and he was not really aware of it. That's a way where God also puts ideas in our heads about, also about visiting and so on. That's why it's good to, and also sometimes 
we read in the scripture that demons can put bad ideas in our heads. So there are different little things that can happen. But the conscience is also part of the way God has made us, and the conscience also kind of has an opinion. It speaks into our lives. Um, our conscience is very important for our Christian life, for everyone's life, but it is not sufficient. Uh, I read a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Can our consciences change? Look, sometimes people can do something with a clear conscience and they're doing something wrong. Their conscience should be like a little bright, uh, a little bright light. You can just stop, 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 stop. But no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just, it just, it, it. The thing about the conscience is that our conscience needs to be educated. We are all born with certain, I think God stamped something into our conscience, and there are some things which all human beings know are right and wrong. But society also has an influence on our conscience, and some things just feel right because everybody else does them. So an important task in our Christian life, and that's part of the reason why we have we meditate on God's word and why you have Bible conferences and so on, is that we want to let the word of God run through us to educate our conscience. So that our conscience would, hey, hey, would flash when, when it's supposed to flash and help us live in harmony with God's word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, you find a discussion about eating certain kind of foods. And some Christians thought, no, nah, it's okay to eat McDonald's. And some other Christians said, no, McDonald's, no, that's an American junk food. No, no, that's not that. You can't damage a body, you know, putting that kind of stuff in. Now, there was a debate about, about the rightness of certain foods or, or, or the Sabbath. You know, can you play football on a Sabbath? And is the Sabbath a Sunday or Saturday? And you now all these debates. And some people had a clear conscience about it. And some people didn't. So what's the, um, in, in Romans 14, we see the same discussions around your conscience. What should we do with our conscience? And Paul says there, look, you might have a clear conscience to have a, a big burger, a big piece of meat. But if your brother thinks Christians should be vegetarians and you eat a big burger in, in front of him, you'll be damaging your brother. It is better not to eat meat than to damage the work world because of a burger or a piece of meat. Um, so it teaches us how to go along with our consciences. And here, before I move on, I'd like to give you an interesting, or oh, I find a very useful thing. If your conscience, um, if you have a clear conscience about something, but that something is wrong, and you do it anyway, then you're acting wrongly because it's wrong. But if you think something is wrong and it's good, um, sorry, if you, yeah, and it, how should I put this? If you think something, I'll give you an example. Sometimes um, other people, other Christians do something that you think is wrong. Maybe they watch a certain film or read a certain book or they drink something and you think, no, no, I don't think Christians should do that. But you see other Christians do it, and then you think, well, since they do it, I'm going to do it too. So you think it's wrong, and you do it anyway. What the scripture tells us is that when you think something is wrong, and you do it, you're sinning and doing so. So the best way is first educate your, Bible, your, your mind biblically. And that will help you see what is right and wrong. And don't go against your conscience. It is no good thing to go against your conscience. So if all the other Christians are going to, uh, you know, drinking something or going to a certain film, and you think it's wrong, first sit down with the word or with it and discuss, now, is it right or is it wrong? If you're really convinced it's still wrong, don't do it. Let the other ones do it, but you don't. Don't go against your conscience. If other churches do it this way and your church doesn't, don't follow what other churches are doing just because other churches are doing. We need to find out what scripture says about how we should run our personal life, our family life, our church life. And when we see green light from scripture, 
then we have a clear conscience to take the step. So let's not kill our consciences by going against them. There is something God has given us and it's useful to, uh, to help us live in a way that pleases the Lord. Now, let's move on. Uh, in verse um, 4 and 5, we see that Paul recalls your tears, long to see you. Um, verse 5, it reminded of your sincere faith, which lived first, first in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. I'd like here only to stress how important family life is. We see beautiful qualities in the life of Timothy, and they came through his mother and grandmother. An ideal place to develop the conscience biblically is at home. We're blessed with four children. They're all kind of growing up to a married and two on the way to getting married. And we have four grandchildren now. And we realize that Christian homes is a fantastic place to help our children appreciate God's word, love the Lord Jesus, and want to live for him. We see that. So it's to form the conscience of our children with the principles from God's word. And Timothy benefited from that. Now, I must move on, uh, and I see, for example, in verse 6 and 7, Paul encourages Timothy to, to um, keep the gift alive and burning, the gift that God had given him. Maybe God has given us certain gifts, capacities to do things. If we become so busy with other things, our gifts can begin to um, kind of get cold. Um, maybe Timothy was a little bit shy. So he encourages them that God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, of love, self-discipline. So, hey, those gifts, God wants to use them to bless other people, says Paul to Timothy. And also to us, let's use our gifts to the blessing of others. Um, then we see in verse um, 8 to 12, we see uh, uh, encouragement. Paul encourages uh, Timothy to strive for a holy life. Um, verse 9, he who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done. A holy life. A number of places in scripture, we're encouraged to be holy because he is holy. Jesus, the Lord has not called us just because he needs people to work. It's not like God has a big business, the, the kingdom business or the church business, and he calls people, hey, hey, I, I need music players, I need teachers, I need Sunday school now come on, join the club. And Now, we can serve him, and that's a privilege to serve him, but he calls us um, first for fellowship, first Corinthians says we're called to the fellowship of Jesus Christ. We're called to have a friendship with Jesus, to, to love him, to, to, to walk with him, to... Uh, yeah, to, 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 to enjoy company. We're called, here also we're called to a holy life. And that has to do with the way we are, the way you react. Just recently in our own church, I spoke a series of three studies on the fruits of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 24. And what encouraged me to, to focus on those nine uh, uh, characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit was because in this corona time, Everybody seems to be stuck at home with your wife and husband and children. And that's the best place to develop the fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit. It's so easy to be kind and generous and smiley and patient with the people you only meet at work or you only meet, uh, you know, once in a while at church. But, you know, the, the, you know, the local ones, you know, spill things and take things. Now, that's the best place to, to, to learn peace and patience and being good. Um, those characters, being holy, being more like Jesus, is very important. And those are, uh, yeah, sometimes even in Christian circles, we focus on activities. He does, he does, he does. But Jesus wants to see how, how, how we live. Paul, actually, I find it quite interesting in, in Galatians 5 also, he says, I suffer pains of childbirth. No, I, I've never had that. Um, I, I've been present when two of my daughters were born, but no, it, I'm very glad I was a man at that point. But um, 
Paul said, I, I, I suffered pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. The character, characteristics of Christ being formed in you and in me, important. Now let me move a bit further on in this chapter. And then uh, we see Paul telling uh, Timothy, verse 13, what you've heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching. Here's another good apple, another good orange. Another good is that we have been entrusted with something important. Paul to Timothy, Paul Timothy to us, sound teaching. Now, we would might prefer to refer to true teaching. We want to have what's truth. And yeah, it, it is, truth is important. But in the pastoral epistles, we find Paul always talking about sound teaching. And it's only in the pastoral epistles. Sound has to do with healthiness. Look, healthy teaching um, creates a healthy home. If you have a healthy teaching about husband-wife relationships and bringing up our kids, you have a healthy home. Healthy teaching about the church creates a healthy church. Sometimes I visit different churches, and sometimes I visit a church and I sense a sense of that everyone's a little bit stressed, that people seem to be afraid of making mistakes. A bit of um, rigid, um, bit legalistic sometimes. And you think, well, that's not healthy. A healthy environment is a place where we can experiment and grow and make mistakes and learn from our mistakes. So Paul tells Timothy and to us, hold on to that healthy teaching which we've been, has been entrusted to us. And at the end of chapter 1, we see, uh, chapter one, we see a number of examples, uh, verse 15 and 16, where um, Paul tells Timothy uh, some examples of good people. As the years go by, the Lord allows a number of people to come into your life. We we're just talking with Phil just now about uh, Zach Boone from, from India. I just met him once at a conference and never seen him again. But you get different people that come into your life, sometimes once, sometimes for a period of a couple or a year or two, and then they go away. You change to another city or, or maybe the other person goes. And I know in my youth, there was one Canadian guy, he really inspired in my Christian life. If my expectations were here, just by seeing the way he lived his Christian life, this Canadian, he, he, he challenged me to grow. To not just be happy with John 3.16, but to get into God's word, to dig deeper. There's more to find, there's more to enjoy. Thank God for those good examples. Some people say, no, I don't look at people, I follow Jesus. They think, yeah, of course, we all follow Jesus. But Jesus shows himself sometimes through brothers and sisters that he brings on our way. Brothers and sisters, they're not perfect, but they do inspire us to, to, to seek something even better. Okay, I, it's a pity to have to run a bit, but I'm going to go on to chapter 2 now. So chapter 1, we've seen a number of uh, pastoral tips, mentioned some. In chapter 2, it is more focused on service. Um, and here we find a number of examples the Apostle Paul uses to explain, to explain the Christian life. Now, we Westerners, Europeans, North Americans, we like to describe things in letters. We write a lot of text. Uh, I but um, uh, all, all text, 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 text on how to do things. The Hebrew culture, where the Bible comes from, they're much more uh, prone to use pictures. So, for example, David would say, the Lord is my shepherd. And with that image, you convey so much information that he, the shepherd cares for the sheep, that he knows them by name, name that he looks after them, he brings food to the sheep. That he, now, all that, but we have to write a couple of pages to describe what the Lord does to us. And he describes it just lovely with one image, shepherd. Now, I find Paul doing the same here with Timothy. 
he provides Timothy with six images. And with the six images, the Apostle Paul captures what he wants to say to prepare Timothy for the future. We shall see next, tomorrow, in chapter 3, that the future was going to be challenging. And Paul knew that Timothy had to be well prepared if he was going to be a success and continue to serve the Lord in that difficult future. Let's look then um, briefly at those six different um, images which, the, um, which Paul provides. In verse 3, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affair, affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Serving as a soldier. Um, now, we live in a postmodern, postmodern society. And here in Holland, where I live, it's an extremely liberal country. It's the first country in the world that uh, recognized homosexual marriages. And uh, it is also in the euthanasia. It is really pushing the frontiers. It's a, it's a country with everything, yeah, they say here in Holland. Yeah, why not? Why not? Yes, yeah, should be able to. You should be able to. And with that mentality, you push forward. And I noticed that men, people with postmodern way of thinking have a big trouble with that word authority. It, um, it irritates. You know, everything has to be flexible and plastic and you can always make your own choices. Now you see that also a bit in America. It's a world thing, but it is, in some societies, it's much more evident than in others. And Paul wanted to make clear to Timothy that man, if you're going to be a success in your Christian life, you need to learn to be obedient, like a soldier. When the captain says, look, we're going to get up at four in the morning, you don't get up at six. You don't say, well, I got a bit of a headache. I'm, I'm waking up a bit. You get up at four. And when it's time to jump into, you know, that cold sea or across the river or something, you don't say, well, I've got some new shoes on. I don't want to get them wet. You, you know, if you need to, you, you learn to obey. And Paul knew that if Timothy were to be a success in the future, in a difficult future, he needed to learn to obey the law, to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Another characteristic of being a soldier is that a soldier is focused. You can't be a soldier and at the same time run a pizza house and keep on phoning back home. Hey, how you know? Have you have you got the ingredients and have you bought the cheese? Have you no? You have to kind of leave your secular stuff and focus. And I think we Christians too, like soldiers. We also no, need to learn to focus. Life is full of good things. Well, new Christians are always, my experience with new Christians is that they want to ask now, is this okay? Is this a sin? Is this okay? Is this wrong? Is this good? Is this wrong? You know, and within a year or two, they've worked it out. To distinguish between good and bad, it's not so complicated. But to distinguish between good and what's best, to be able to say no to things that are good because you're going for something better, that, that's a challenge. That's difficult. And um, you need to be focused. And I think a soldier too, there are lots of distractions. Maybe when they're traveling around, they're selling them a good motorbike, really cheap. And I'm not interested in motorbikes. I, I'm a military. I'm, 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 I'm busy with a uh, military calling. There's a big difference between someone going to the Middle East as a tourist and someone going to the Middle East as a soldier. If you go as a tourist, your expectations are different. You expect, you know, to ring the bell at eight in the morning, you know, not early. You expect to find some, you know, you paid for, the hotel has breakfast included, so you expect to have a good breakfast and not just a piece of bread. No, you expect to have a choice. So if you live the Christian life a bit like a tourist, Paul says, you're not going to get there, man. It's the soldier mentality, willing to sacrifice when necessary. The second picture comes a bit further on in verse 5. He says, simply, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. An athlete. Now, every sport has its rules. And 
every sport player has his own ideas of how it should be. Maybe you're playing football and you think the goal is a bit too small or a bit too large. You want it a bit lower, a bit higher. Or when you're jogging a marathon, you think, well, why should I go around the corner? I can see a shortcut here. Why, why bother going the whole up and all the way down when I can just cut across here? But no, the Christian life has its, has its ways. It's not that each one of us has to invent the Christianity to work it out the way we would like it. It's more that Christian, Christ has invented the Christian life, he's invented the church, and we can try to find out the patterns and try to live according to them. There's, um, I notice, I, I'm, I, um, I'm not much of a sport person. I do try to jog once a week, and I cycle twice a week, and I do a bit of a walking here and there, you know, just to keep myself a bit in shape. But people who really want to go into sport, they, they practice a lot. The ones who really go for it, you know, they, they even go to bed at certain times. Maybe the friends are all out till one in the morning, but they go to bed at 10 or 11. Maybe all their friends go off and um, eat a lot in a barbecue or something. And they say, well, I'll just have, uh, you know, just two hamburgers, no more, small ones. Yeah, yeah. I keep, they, they discipline themselves because they want to work well as an athlete. And I think that's also the picture Paul wants to bring to, to Timothy. He says, Timothy, if you're going to be a success in the future, you also, like an athlete, you need to, yeah, respect the biblical rules, but um, the, the, the borderless, you know, the, the, the principles of the game, but be willing to sacrifice in the preparations. Uh, there's a lot of exercise before you actually can actually go and run. If you play an instrument, I saw a number of people with guitars and pianos. Now, my wife is a violinist. Now, for years, hours and hours with that violin up and down, up and down, and now practicing to be able to play in a concert. Our son loves the piano. Now, every morning after breakfast, he gets the scales, up and down the scales. It's practice, practice. You need to practice if you want to do anything well. And also serving the Lord, there's an amount of practice involved and discipline to improve, to be able to serve the Lord well. Then Paul moves on to another example. And that is the example of a farmer, verse 6. A hardworking farmer should first receive the share, or in some translations, the hardworking farmer must work first before he receives the share. And we, we know that farmers tend to be hardworking people. Our daughter, our eldest daughter, and her husband are serving the Lord as missionaries in Peru. And a year or so ago, we were visiting them. And you see these Peruvians working as farmers on the Andes, on the mountains. Wow, it's hard work, man. Farmers work need to be willing to work hard. Now, is the Christian life hard work? Serving the Lord? No, there is hard work involved. Some Christians, we know from Ephesians, Ephesians 2 that we're not saved by good works. But some people think that because we're not saved by good works, that good works are bad. So, no, 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 no. They're good and they work, but they don't save us. They come after we are saved. And if you're organizing a children's activity in the church, a Sunday school or so on, now that's much more work than not doing Conrad, with others in the team, have been organizing this uh, weekend away for you as a church. Now, I know what it's like. It takes energy, the preparations, and trying to get the speaker, and trying to get this, and looking at that. There's energy involved. It's easier not to do it. But like good farmer, Paul tells Timothy, don't be afraid to work hard. Uh, sometimes the fruit takes a long time to come. Sometimes you see it. Sometimes you never see it. But keep on working. But there's more. There's something special about a farmer, which is very different from office work. With office work, you know, you work at it, and when you finish, you print it, and there you have it. You've got some papers, and you can show what you've done. Or you're building in a garage or something, you build something. Now, there it is. You work in a restaurant, you work, you work. Now, there you are, you've got a nice meal. With, um, with a farmer, he has to, or she has to work at... Um, digging the soil, putting the seed in, taking all the bad weeds away, watering it, uh, getting everything in place. But there's no 
way a farmer can make something grow. You can put the tomato seed there, you can put everything, all the ingredients, and then you just have to wait. And if God does not make things grow, it will not grow. And I think that's an important lesson we need to learn also as Christians. Paul thought that was important for Timothy. I'm sure it's important for you and for me too. That yes, we need to work in God's kingdom and God's in the church, serve the Lord, but we cannot make things grow. And the idea of a farmer that he does his bit and then waits and prays for rain and, and waits and prays that things will actually grow. Now that's an attitude too. We serve the Lord with our children. We, we try to bring them to the Lord, but we can't force one child. We can force them to be baptized, but you do a damage if you do that. We need to create the environment and then pray that the Lord will do his thing. In building up a new church, the same thing. You create the environment, you do the sowing, you take the weeds out, you create the, and then Lord, please make it grow. And unless the Lord builds the house, nothing. That image is so important for Timothy, but also for us. It's that kind of balance between working hard, but it doesn't depend on my work. And if I don't work, if I don't put seeds, they won't be growing. Also. So learning, a farmer learns to work uh, in dependence of the Lord. And I think that's also useful from this image for us, to be a good farmer. Now, in these last 10 minutes, I'm going to jump a bit here, and we're going to look at the image. There's a little, nice little song there, which a um, uh, uh, trustworthy saying, which... Um, Paul uh, shares with Timothy, but I'm going to skip that and I'm going to jump to verse 15. Do your best um, to present yourself to God as an approved workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. A workman. Imagine a builder, a workman who builds houses. I remember when I worked in London, I, lived, I worked in a, um, uh, in a building just south of the River Thames, and from the sixth floor where my office was, I could see uh, the River Thames, a little bit of it, it was nice, and there was a piece of ground and they started building a new building next to ours. Now, it's very interesting every morning when you come into work and you take your coat off and you sit there, you stare out the window just to see what's, what's happening, what's happening. Now, interesting to see these people with white helmets on and blue helmets and yellow helmets and they're running around doing their different things. Um, there was a cabin, a porter cabin, and quite a few people with white, especially the ones with white helmets, would go into that porter cabin and stay. I imagine they had biscuits and coffees and things in there, but more, they had the design of the following building. So they would go in there and study the design and then they go out and start giving instructions about, you know, taking measurements and, uh, you know, some meters here and something there. And uh, Can you imagine a group of engineers who come together in the porter cabin with their coffee and biscuits and the designs and think, oh, what a fantastic design. Wow, this building, man, this is going to really be impressive here in London. Oh, man. And, and look at this corner here and look at this roof. Look at the angle. Oh, yeah. Oh, lunch break. In the afternoon, they do the same. Oh, five o'clock, we go back home again. And in the morning, they come back again and they study. They're all so enthusiastic about the, you know, the days turn into weeks and they have lovely times discussing the design. With all, look at the toilets. Look at, look at that window. That's very well placed. Man, the sun. As they spend the time discussing the design and wonders of the design, the grass outside begins to grow. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. It's easy for us Christians to spend our time studying the design, and we need it. We need to. But we study the design in as much as we need it to build. It's not to discuss, oh, how wonderful the design, how wonderful. Now, of course, it's a wonderful design. Even David in bed was saying, oh, I love you, Lord, your, your Lord, and so on. And now he got quite excited about it. There's nothing wrong with that. But then after being uh, impressed with God's word, we need to use it to live. To live yeah, the way your character, 
to, 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 to the way you bring up your kids, the way you work, the way you do church, you know, the, and that's part of the image here that we're supposed to be a builder, says Paul, you know, a good worker who handles well the word of truth. That means study it well and then go out and build. Now, I don't know what it's like in Norway, but in Holland, spontaneity is a virtue. Everything, if you say I'm a very spontaneous person, we go, oh, cool, you're, you're, you're alive, you're spontaneous. We, um, we rent a room here in our house. It's next to the garage. We have a room we rent to students. And when I put it on the website to rent it out to, to a student, um, we usually rent it out to university, usually girls, because I, I travel quite a bit, so then I prefer to have a, a girl renting the room. And quite often, nearly always, when they describe themselves, when they send, you know, to apply for the room, they say, Ik ben spontan, I am spontaneous. Right? So I think, well, maybe these Dutch girls think that's good then, you know? Can you imagine, I said, you know, can you imagine you go into a hospital and you've got a spontaneous surgeon. Oh, well, um, or, 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 you, know, you take your car to the garage and now do you, do you want a systematic mechanic or a spontaneous mechanic? Oh, I think I prefer the, the, the... Spontaneity is nice. It's like the cream on the cake. Um, but you need a bit, of, a bit of structure. And the structure, we find it in God's word. Builder. Um, study the design and then ask God for the grace to build according to that design. Now, we go further and go to verse 20, numbers, the picture number six. In a large, large house, there are articles, not only of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Um, verse 21, if a man cleans, cleans, cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a useful instrument for noble purpose. The picture here, which Paul wants to share with Timothy, or shares with Timothy, is a house with utensils, with things in it. And for the sake of our imagination, imagine a kitchen. I think most of us are aware of a kitchen. And if uh, there are some men available who do not know what a kitchen looks like, now I encourage you to explore the kitchen and give your wife a hand from time to time. Now, in the kitchen, we find different utensils. We have frying pans, saucepans, forks, spoons, uh, liquidizers. Um, and the picture is that, that each Christian is like a utensil in that, uh, in that kitchen. Maybe a very skinny sister would be a fork. Uh, maybe a bit of a big brother could be a frying pan or something. Or, you know, everyone has a place in that kitchen. And then the Lord comes and he wants to cook a spiritual meal. Now, when you want to cook, then there are two things at least that need to be, need to happen. The first is that if you grab a saucepan, you want the saucepan to be clean. And the second is that you want to have the instruments available. If they're being used for something else, then you just can't use it. Now, I remember... Years ago, I was just recently married at that time, and my wife took off, we were living in London, my wife took off to Holland with our first child to show the baby off, and I spent about 10 days alone at home. And now, I thought it a bit too much work to wash the dishes every day, so I would just kind of cook a meal, eat the meal, and just plonk it in the kitchen, and then it began to kind of pile up a bit, and I thought, before my wife comes back, I'll clear everything up in one go. Um, that was my idea of being efficient. But what would happen, of course, is that you, when you're going to come and fry an egg and the frying pan has bits of beans stuck on it from yesterday or the day before or three days ago, then you think, oh, um, no, I get another saucepan and I can fry an egg in a saucepan. I don't need a frying pan. You put a bit of oil in a saucepan and you just get on and you do it. Dear brother and dear sister, the Lord wants to use, he has a strong preference to use clean instruments. Maybe there's someone in your neighborhood that is looking for God and God wants to use you to be the vehicle to encourage, to say something. But if you have a non-forgiving attitude with somebody, if you're, you know, if you're playing around, you know, once in a while with pornography, if you kind of 
have a problem with someone at church and you don't want to solve it, you just kind of leave it there. We, we dirty ourselves. And it's difficult for God to use dirty instruments. I won't say that God never does, because I see that God sometimes even uses non-Christians, also in the Old Testament. But when he uses non-Christians or uses dirty Christians, it's not for the blessing of the instrument, it's for the blessing of someone else. But when we are in condition, when we've forgiven or asked for forgiveness, when we're clean, then we are used for blessing and at the same time we are also blessed. The instrument is blessed and the people also blessed. So I'm getting close to the end now, but I'd like to... Just pause a little moment and say, if there is something in your life that needs to be cleaned up, don't pretend it's okay. Don't think, well, all the people do it out, so I can do it too. Clear up. Have a clear conscience before God. Live holy lives. And then, then we become useful in God's hands. I learned as missionary 15 years in Colombia, I remember very clearly a lesson I learned there, was that when we're too busy with other things, good opportunities go by. God's work doesn't stop. God calls us to do something and we're too busy. God just smiles and says, okay, I call someone else. And they get the job gets done, but not with, not with you. We miss out on the blessing if we're too focused on our own little projects. So cleanliness and availability. Lessons from being a good instrument. I go for my last one now, or Paul's last picture, and that is in verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be, instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, etc., etc. The last picture which Paul thought important for Timothy to know was that you need to be the Lord's servant. Now, We've used the word servant often in scripture is because we're a bit embarrassed to use the word slave. It brings too many images of Africa and all these other kind of things which we've heard about recently in the news. So then we think, oh no, that word slave is um, um, but Paul does. That is the word. And Paul said to Timothy, look, you need to see yourself not as a slave of the church, not as a slave of other people, but Christ has bought you from slavery so that you can be his slave. I know some Christians really find it awkward. They think, oh no, I'd like to be his son or his daughter, the friend of God, but slave. You know, the whole idea, man, but the Lord is the best possible master. There's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, it's good to be owned by him rather than trying to run our own show. And Paul said to Timothy, look, man, the future is difficult. If you want to be successful in the future, you need to see yourself as a slave. As a slave of Jesus Christ. And that determines what we do. Because a slave seeks to serve the master. But it also determines the way in which we do it. We see that very clearly. Not just teach, but you know, do it in a good way. Not just force, no. Let the Spirit of God work with you. Um, not resentful. Uh, you know, try to convince, but you know, the Spirit must lead to repentance. God must open the eyes. So you do God's, word, God's work in a nice way. That the way we do it will also be pleasing to the Lord. Now, I see our time is up. And um, time to call to an end. Chapter one had a number of practical, you know, some tips, pastoral tips. In chapter two, we found six images that help us view the Christian life the way the Apostle Paul viewed it. And that would help us also in Norway and here in Holland and also there in America or wherever. You know, it would help us to live the Christian life. It sets the right expectations in our mind to be able to live the glory of our Lord. God bless you.